so Sam is very interesting. Sam, um, I mean, you started as a, fo a photojournalist. That's I right. You, you sort of, you know, back in the day. Yeah, well, I, I started off in a hip-hop group, actually. A hip-hop group, 15, okay. Yeah, <laughs> but then that didn't last for too long, um, you know. But, yeah, I ended up being a photojournalist. Right. And, um, and then kind of my career took uh, a bit of a different path. So what's cool about this is you, you're the founder and CEO of something called um, Barcroft Studios. That's we'll right. Talk obviously a lot more about. Um, and what's interesting about Barcroft is uh, it started in 2003. Help me out here. Yeah, we started the business in 2003. I was a photojournalist, and um, I'd left uh, the Daily Mail um, in 2000 um, when it became obvious to me that the print uh, trade in the UK uh, was at its kind of peak. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, the managing editors there were trying to find cost savings and um, trying to work out how they could compete in a super tough industry all of a sudden. Yep. Um, and so I could see that I would have more fun being a contributor than being an executive. Right. So I decided to uh, pick up my cameras and go out on the road and, and cover news events yeah, all around yeah. the world. And um, in 2003, I got a little busy. So I realized I had to pal up with some uh, compadres right. and try and do, uh, make an agency instead mm -hmm. of just being a single person. <clears throat> so what I love about this story is that you, 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 you always stuck with factual content. I mean, That's that was right. something, and, it, and you were, had a real desire to do factual. Right. I remember at one point, and this wasn't that long ago, maybe maybe it was a year ago, might, might have been a little longer, you said to me that <clears throat> at one point you, you almost got seduced into making, you know, silly cats do silly things on skateboards because that seemed to be the thing that was trending on YouTube and that seemed to be the only way to make money. That's but right. that, 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 that a shift happened that we'll talk about that allowed you to take Barcroft to the next step. But mm. before we get into that, I just want to say that what's interesting about him is he's stuck with factual and I know a lot of you guys do documentary and factual um, programming, so I think that's really interesting. And then the other thing is, is that you built up this company really from, as you said, a couple of pals, mm. right? And you built it up, and it's been 13 years you've been Yes, uh, no, longer, 16 years. Six, oh my yeah. God, 16 years, right. And then, um, spoiler alert, um, was it Thursday? Friday. Friday. Friday, we got the news, you got the news, that you had actually sold your company for right. close to $30 million. It's uh, 23.5 million pounds, mm. which is a 9.4 EBITDA, if anybody cares about that kind of thing, which I do because I'm a business journalist. <laughs> so congratulations, round of applause for Barcroft. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and you sold, interestingly, to Future Publishing, which That's is a right. Future PLC, which is a publishing company. So talk, talk us through that, and then I think we have a sizzle reel we have to get to at some sure. point, but give us a little setup about Yeah, so about that. eventually we moved from print and uh, photographic media, which was the, really the media of choice at the beginning of this century. And we realized that we could take our journalism and the access to great stories that we were finding and move them gently into video and television as well. Um, if we had a big exclusive in a newspaper or a magazine, we understood that we would get telephone calls from broadcasters and producers saying, uh, would you mind giving me the telephone number of uh, <laughs> the man that's just let Madonna adopt his children? Yeah. And we'd be like, no, we probably won't no, give you the telephone no. number. But you um, can buy the footage from us. Well, or, or we can <laughs> collaborate on an amazing documentary about it. Yeah. So, um, so really, the entrepreneur in me realized that um, the journalism we were doing had extra value that we weren't exploiting. So over time, through lots of trial and error, we uh, slowly broke into the television documentary market by partnering with other producers. Mm -hmm. um, and we started <coughs> video... Um, back uh, kind of a little early. We borrowed some money, we bought some cameras, we hired some folks, and then about six months later, that all stopped again. Mm -hmm. um, it, and really the change there was 3G video, because when 3G came in, video came off your desktop. Does anyone remember Real Player? Mm. You know, um, and all the horrible time we all spent buffering on right. video for hours at work, because most people couldn't even get it at home. And then... Um, <laughs> And then people did start um, consuming digital right. video, mostly on their mobile phones. Right. And so eventually where we've got to now, I think, is um, our company now makes mostly television and video. 
Um, we still do a licensed photography, but it's a much smaller part of our business. And um, <coughs> we've created an ecosystem where fantastic access and stories can be exploited by whichever media makes the most mm -hmm. sense. Um, and we've created our own um, series that live across lots of social media. And the best of the content turns into television shows for people like Netflix. And that's also interesting about this, because you're really coming from the the online or digital, we call it, even though it's slightly a misnomer because television is all digital, but sort of the online environment and then transfer to television when it makes sense to transfer right. to Right, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes we make more money from the social media and video side of our business mm -hmm. than we do from the television side of our business. <coughs> um, so, so what we know now is that, for example, in the UK, the Observer newspaper has been running for more than 250 years. That's a real good product legend, longevity. Longevity? Longevity. Yeah, yeah apologies. Um, that's very different from MySpace, which lasted about five years. Yeah, um, about five minutes, yeah. yeah Sorry. Um, <laughs> but the product lifecycle we know is much faster now. So if mm. you're a content provider, you have to um, have a multiple a, a kind of balanced portfolio approach, which means you have to embrace change mm -hmm. and you have to work with change all the time to make sure that you're not uh, becoming irrelevant because it's very easy at the moment if you stand still, even when you're doing well, if you stand still for one moment, um, you can be in trouble. So what's really fantastic about our new partnership with Future is that they are a very well-respected um, company that's been going for some time. It was founded by Chris Anderson, who mm. runs TED Talks, um, right. if anybody has heard of that. Yes. Um, <laughs> and um, essentially, uh, they are one of the best performing stocks on the British markets this year because they've taken uh, publishing, magazine publishing, and brought it into the 21st century. Mm. Um, and so we're super excited. To and they have lots of niche group. products, like, you know, specific kinds of magazines that then yeah. they bring into the, you know, make videos about. They mm -hmm. sort of, they're, they're bridging the gap, so to speak, between print and video. In, in well, the thing that way. really works across all of storytelling is community mm -hmm. and a sense of belonging. And so if you're really into rock music or if you're really into cycling or if you know if you're an enthusiast you come you want to be around people like you that love mm. the things you love and mm. future have done a great job of realizing that, that their magazines were in fact communities mm -hmm. and so um, that is very much how we've approached our tv uh, play across social media especially um, and the same thing is true there as is in publishing and i think when you look at the music business it's found a new model that's now working fantastically well again mm -hmm. um, and i think that publishing <laughs> is, uh, I think, future at the front of that are doing exactly the same thing. They're, they're coming out of a challenging time for print and to re discovering how it can find a new world um, uh, in digital. It's very interesting that, you're, that you've been purchased by really a publishing company. Right. As opposed to like a big media company. You know, you mm. weren't bought by ITV or France Television no. or something like that or End of All Shine. You were, you know, you were bought by a publishing company, but in some ways you'll be more comfortable there because they kind of understand the niche, the fandom, mm. the, the how you actually approach your audience. Mm. And I also think, think having been part of publishing, because we've been licensing content to publishers all the way through, we've been right. on the real challenging journey that <coughs> print publishing has had over the last 20 years. Mm. And um, so we understand why they've got to where they've got to mm -hmm. and also are super excited about um, yeah, yeah. The, what's coming up as right. well. Why don't we play the sizzle reel now? So well, let's o do clip one, please. I really just be me and people <coughs> just watch me. If I live my life how other people want to live, I wouldn't be who I am. <coughs> I just love being like now. Uh, I like to live my life as journey and adventure. Now that I've finally let go, my confidence has skyrocketed. <coughs> they tell me it's lucky to have two moms and a dad, but I don't know. I've been told it's a phase like my whole life. Why do you wear makeup? Why your hair gotta be so big? Why you always gotta wear And then you walk in and it's, bam, 
three, and today I got to see it. Yes, yes, that's why you're the king, though. So what precisely happened? What I want to say, I'm not questioning. I'm just there. I'm a body, and I'm giving you my all. Very cool. Thank you. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we saw in that video, you saw, you know, there was Facebook Watch, there was mm -hmm. Snap, then mm -hmm. you had, you know, Netflix, BBC. So talk a little bit about um, how you publish to different platforms and what your ecosystem looks like, and we'll drill down a little bit into Snap um, as well. But okay, sure. So. Um, by the way, my job is to make sure you're awake after lunch, so th that's the gentlest <laughs> of the videos you're going to see, okay? It's going to yeah. get a bit, uh, it's gonna get get a bit more, more hardcore <laughs> as we go forward. So, um, uh, okay, we, we basically have been evolving our business really organically, really fast, um, with a fairly small team um, in a kind of startup culture for 16 years without stopping. I'm actually 29. I know I look a bit older than that. <laughs> but, um, but, it's, but it's quite hard to operate at that frequency for a long time. Mm -hmm. So a lot, last year we did a big reorganization play about how we organized um, for a non-startup uh, kind of philosophy, because it's really different. Um, and we decided to work out, to basically divide into internal and external production. And um, so what happened to us was the traditional TV model, especially for you tech people out there, is you have a nice idea for a TV show. You go, oh, I've got it. I've got the next Game of Thrones. <laughs> Hooray, off we go to the bank. But you don't go to a bank. You go and knock on the door of um, a person at a TV network or now a streamer, and you say, hey, it's me. I've got it. This is the new show. And if you're really lucky, they say, Sam, fantastic. Here is $10 million. <laughs> go and make it. Come back in a year when it's finished and hand it over. And um, thanks very much. And and that's the business model. So you're cash flowed all the way through. You make your show. You keep about 10 to 20 percent of the income from it, and that's how you make money. Right? It's a lousy business model if, when you do it like that. Really, when it's compared against the real world. But that is how TV works right now. Um, Unless you keep some of the back end and get distribution on secondary rights, but that's not doesn't happen with Netflix. Anyway, it doesn't that, happen in the yes. TV model as it's reaching that same zenith exactly. that print got to, which is kind of where TV is now. Mm -hmm. But it, it has um, it's basically where it's going, even if it's not there right. entirely yet. So, so you decided not to get into that? Well, no, we d tried every Death day, roll. nothing but to get to that. <laughs> I, I crawled up to the front door of Channel 4 <laughs> and every week uh, begging for meetings with um, <laughs> very well-spoken, clever people and, um, <laughs> and came up with millions ide of ideas that were often shot down before I'd even really finished the first glass of free water. <laughs> and, um, and, and basically, um, a lot of my time was spent trying to be really nice to these folks and getting human humiliated and feeling pretty worthless. Um, <laughs> but we did, we did slowly get there, mostly through partnership. And also, we realized we had stories that they had to have that they couldn't get from anyone else. Right. And so despite the fact that I didn't go to the right school and hadn't worked at the BBC, um, sometimes they really did have no choice but to take a deep breath and work with us. Um, and then, <laughs> um, and that's when you had the story, when you told me, yeah, how do we get this to work? How do we scale this model is that is that the moment well no i mean we've had that? lots of moments like that that, that was okay. probably a little earlier on okay. but but essentially where we know I'm, I'm answering some other question that's popped up in my head <laughs> where we get back to is um we met we now make a lot of our own content right because that tv model we just couldn't scale quickly enough yeah. and we couldn't get past all those chat pol politics and challenges of that we have grown a good tv business right. um uh, over time, but um, we decided to just make our own video content. So you had to obviously make it more, well, inexpensive, more inexpensive. Yeah, we yeah. needed to, we were sending journalists around the world to cover stories that we would then license to magazines and newspapers and news shows. Um, and we said, guys, let's just make sure we're shooting video at the same time. And we very slowly worked out um, how to make video. It was terrible. Go onto our YouTube channel. If you're ever feeling like you want um, <laughs> uh, a sense that anything's possible, go and watch the first five videos on my YouTube channel. They're some <laughs> of the worst videos ever produced by a human. Um, I feel there's probably animals that can make videos better than that now. Um, but I think um, uh, essentially we, we, we worked around the problem. The obstacle became has right. now become the opportunity, but at the time we just worked 
worked around it. And yeah. over that was 12 years ago. So the opportunity was, you know, get out of the sort of the commissioners saying no, no, no all the time. Make your own content. Right. Learn how to make it economically, but uh -huh. obviously find interesting stories that would then maybe resonate somewhere. And then, of course, the big thing was, which is what we're trying to get onto, which is sort of the rise of Snap and wa mm. Facebook Watch. So tell us about that and YouTube. Yeah, sure. So YouTube, we just started putting our <coughs> content on 12 years ago because we were trying to license the footage in a world where copyright was still king. We were trying to license the footage to TV shows, and we realized no one was ever going to come up with an idea of coming to our website. You know, And so they had to find our content through search. Right. And so well, back then, if you had video, the way to do it was to get it into YouTube, put tons of metadata on it, cover it with big, huge, ugly captions and music so people couldn't rip it off, and then <laughs> have a researcher um, license it from you because right. they couldn't steal it. And so essentially, that was we, we used YouTube as a shop window for footage. Um, and then one day, we had um, a film called The Only Man That Can Swim With a Polar Bear. And uh, we did a story in Canada uh, about a guy called Mark who had a pet polar bear. And they used to go swimming in their swimming pool every morning together. And we filmed that. And um, all of a sudden, it went on YouTube with a r nice little voiceover from one of my features writers. <laughs> and, um, and it got millions of views. And the check came through the post. And I was like, huh, right, this is interesting. We're getting, we, we licensed it. To, uh, probably ProSieben or RTL over here to a couple of Japanese news shows. We had it, it was a double page spread in the Sun newspaper. You know, that was our typical business model. But also then we had this direct to consumer kind of advertising income. And so and then it went on to become used in the YouTube zeitgeist of the year because it was right. a really successful little film. Right. And we realized that, that there was a business model of advertising right. that we could uh, put within our ecosystem right. of licensing. And that was really where that was born. And then over the years, as the other platforms have started the same kind of free-to-air advertising-based VOD approach, we have now a catalog of 2,500 films and episodes of shows that we can take out and mm -hmm. partner with people mm -hmm. where we give them the content and then we share the revenue. Right. Um, and that has become a real big part yeah. of our business. And it's helped because you as you say, other ones have launched. Yeah. Facebook Watch, yeah. Snap. We, we, many, many, many have right. launched, and um, there are a handful of successful ones. Exactly. Yeah. So let's, we've got two videos to look at now. Yeah. The first one is, the I think, the YouTube one. Yeah. We have the YouTube version of this, and then we have the um, Snap version. I'm going to so just, can I give it a little tea? I want you so to talk about. So this is our latest up. launch um, <coughs> of a show. We started off with individual videos. After some years, we worked out that they should be strands. And then after some more time, we worked out they should be shows. And this is how the ecosystem has changed from channels on YouTube to, to shows. And so essentially, this is our latest release, um, which is our most su successful ever release. This is designed for social media as a show for social media, which has taken all the learnings about the algorithm, um, viewer um, kind of behavior and everything. We have 63 million followers across our shows now. We're getting a billion views a month. There's a ton of data. So now we know how to optimize the narrative for uh, success. This is about weight loss. Depending lock. on the, 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 the platform. Yeah, right. so, okay. well, depend and, and really not that depending on the platform other than vertical or horizontal. Okay. You know, there's two shapes now for video. So you make right. one like that and one like <laughs> that. And if you've got time, you make a square one in the middle. But <laughs> essentially, um, uh, this is a show called Brand New Me. Um, which has been our biggest ever launch. And that's because it's about a topic that a lot of people care about, which is obesity and overcoming obesity. Okay. Um, and it's inspiring. So mm -hmm. people, uh, it's useful to people because it acts as an aid in their, their life and making their life better. Um, and I think we've got two versions of one of the episodes right. to show you the different approaches so for different platforms. So before we run it, why did you know that obesity was a topic that people wanted to know about? Because across our other shows, if we featured an episode that had obesity in it, especially uh -huh. if there was a transformative element to it, so um, a positive ending, a mm -hmm. big happy ending, yep. then we saw them rate much higher than okay. other um, topics. Um, and so we'd actually done a show about a... Uh, a body positive dance troupe in um, the US that had just gone off the charts and we were reading all the comments about it and it was all about the fact that these people were an inspiration, that there were people that wanted to change okay. their lives and they needed examples of how to do that. And so we right. asked our development team to design a show that would 
to take advantage of all this data that was incoming and design a show that we felt would feature real stories that, that epitome, that, that opportunity, or that viewer need, essentially. Got it, and so that's how you got to this. Yeah. Show. All right, so first we're gonna play the YouTube one, and then it's the Snap one. So play yeah. those two videos back to back. And it's not me. When we met, we were both heavy. <clears throat> I weighed 295 pounds. I weighed 333 pounds. My anxiety was almost crippling some days. I couldn't believe how big I got. I just really hated what I saw when I looked in the mirror. That was kind of my aha moment. Finally, we found that drive to do something about it. I just kept pushing, and I wanted to set a great example for my daughter. I've lost 125 pounds. And I lost 95 pounds. The transformation has been incredible. I think they look amazing. I'm really self-conscious about my belly and about my loose skin, which I'm having removed in a few days' time. I think this outlet for post-surgery, so it is surgery in the morning. I'm just hoping and praying that everything goes well. Bye. So, um... Just, be uh, we're, we're just before we run the other one, yeah. that, that's the YouTube version of that mm -hmm. show that went out and did well. Obviously, when we make content for Snap and Facebook, we're also making vertical versions. Mm -hmm. And so um, they are optimized in a different way, slightly faster up uh, audience decision. So you have to grab people much quicker. Um, and um, obviously, it has to be optimized for mobile phones, so it's vertical instead. And uh, this is the Snap version, as we call it. When we met, we were both heavy. I weighed 295 pounds. <clears throat> I weighed 333 pounds. Finally, we found that drive to do something yeah. about it. The transformation has been incredible. I think they look amazing. I'm really self-conscious about my blue skin, which I'm having removed. So it's a shorter tease. We use um, split screen and um, the text is more prominent and it's just a, we get to the absolute root of the narrative within about 10 seconds, which is really important for capturing those viewers in vertical. So when you look at the different platforms, how do you figure, I mean, you obviously monetize, you get different kinds of money from them. Mm -hmm. How do you figure that out? You know, how do you figure out the economics? Is it, do you have to change the algorithm? I mean, what do you have to do to actually optimize on these um, platforms? There's a, a, lo a lot of um, learning over a long period of time mm. is honestly how we do it. There, there is a playbook. We actually helped write YouTube's most recent playbook with them. Oh, really? Um, and I think that, there is a lot of knowledge that we've made from mistakes, really, over the years and from just lots of iterations. So that we're making around 40 original episodes um, a month at the moment. So we have a hmm. what we call our speedy system. Um, if anybody hasn't seen The Founder, if you're running a business or interested in business, watch a movie called The Founder. It's all about the beginning of McDonald's. And mm -hmm. um, McDonald's have a, a speedy system, which is how everybody works at the different stations to be super efficient and to get everybody their food really quickly. Um, we've kind of developed, without really meaning it, a speedy system around video. Yeah. So in our main office in East London, we have around 50 people working on internal production, and they really do sit in different seats, especially so everybody knows who does what, and so that we can get a huge amount of content through a system. And it's designed on a print newsroom, so a weekly magazine mm -hmm, newsroom, mm -hmm. but that's been combined with television uh, expertise to really create a kind of um, a system that works really well. So we, at any time, we have about 100 episodes in production, sometimes more, <laughs> and they're flowing around this small group of young people, mostly, who um, really are what we often what we call predators. So mm. they're producers and editors, oh, and, um, <laughs> and they all have um, they all have multiple skills um, um, <laughs> because a lot of them we bring up through apprenticeships yeah. and training. Um, and because th when we started doing video, no one did video. Yep. Everyone did TV or right. journalism, right. and video was this kind of weird commercial thing in the middle where people did videos for comp companies. Yeah. Um, and now there's this whole new generation of producers coming in who can do everything. They can write scripts, they can commission video, they can um, do the legal checks, they can um, do the interviews, they can cast, they can produce, they can edit produce, you know, because they have to be able to do that now. So I love it. If predators. Predators. Okay. You know me and, and my do they words. also check the algorithms as well? Is that their job or is there another team? No, we that? have a data and audience team and, okay. and they their job is to schedule the episodes on each different um, platform and to use, uh, and when you publish a video in social, 
sure it's not just putting a video up. You know, you have to think about the audience, think about how you position the film with the text that goes mm -hmm, around mm -hmm. it, think about very carefully about the title, and most importantly, the title and the picture that goes with it. Because as Netflix or Snap or Facebook or anyone will tell you, the most important thing is the photo on the, uh, at the beginning of the video, yep. because that's when you make your human decision, decision. your subconscious decision right. about whether or not you engage with that image. Yep. So um, we made a, a show for Netflix recently, and we had to provide 30 different um, tile images, you know, because they try, they A-B test all of right. the images around shows to make <laughs> sure that people engage more with the show. And when they find the ones that certain gr audience groups engage with, they start, they stick with those ones. Yep, not, not they, they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about franchises now. Okay. How do you build them? How d what's the role of iteration? And I think we're trying to get to a clip from Dog Dynasty. So sure. Talk about that. So, so what we realized, we started off by just doing individual little mini docs about anything and everything that we thought that our audience would find interesting on YouTube. And then as we went through time, we really only started to engage with Facebook at a big level two years ago because Facebook didn't have their video products fixed until two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and even uh, Snap, probably about the same time, a little bit even sooner than that, uh, more recently. So on YouTube, we realized after time that people loved shows, not channels. You know, people love channels if they're a person, like PewDiePie or um, Zoella, for example. Right. So they'll follow a person on a channel. That's right. But they really, people, I think all of us love shows. We don't love channels as much as we might have done. We might love... Um, a channel that is specific, like Comedy Central, but mm -hmm. we're unlikely, but that's because we know exactly what we're going to get, or Sky Sports. But mm -hmm. um, the generalist channels, the ITVs, the RTLs, they're harder to yeah. create. France Bleu, yeah. yeah, harder to create uh, an emotion around. Mm -hmm. And so in a world that is getting really head up, we realized we needed shows. So before MIP, a couple of years ago, we decided to um, sort our individual documentaries into strands. So we created 10 different strands that all our documentaries would fit into. Because mostly the successful ones, we could see were in similar places all the time. You know, everybody really liked certain things. And so one of the things we did was we created an animals channel. And on one of those channels, we did a, a, a little story about the world's biggest pit bull in um, uh, New England. And it did really well. And so somebody said, why don't we go back and see if they have another story about this pit bull? Because it really, it was, his name's Hulk. He's amazing. <laughs> and, um, and he became very famous. And essentially, we went back and tried to get a couple more episodes. And every single one just had amazing numbers, amazing love on all the comments. And so we created a show called Dog Dynasty with Marlon, who owns Hulk. Um, <laughs> and who knew that pit bulls were such a thing? You know, yes. but the pit bull community is a massive, dedicated, focused community of uh, people all around the world. So you now suddenly have lots of shows about pit bulls. We right. have, well, we created a series called Dog Dynasty. Dog, which is a series. Yeah. So it's not a channel, it's a series That's of shows. That's right, it's a show, yeah. But it's in a genre or a franchise. Yeah, it came okay. out of, a, it came out of a, a channel, and we realized we needed a show. So now on our Animals channel, we have multiple different shows that, became, that came out of that. And Dog Dynasty now has got to the point where it's got such a following that we have 100,000 people in a private group on Facebook just to talk about this show and who to all talk about pit bulls and how great they are. And we're doing e-commerce, so we're selling Dog Dynasty apparel out of the videos. So in Facebook and YouTube have given us the technology to be able to shop the videos so that um, <laughs> we're doing e-commerce. But people are real fans of this brand. They want to wear the stuff because mm -hmm. they love this family and they love their dogs. And um, I never would have imagined it, but it is one of those things that has become a thing. So yeah. It's not, I mean, think about that. You're a production company. Right. And now you're selling... Pitbull t-shirts as yeah, well. Yeah. Fant fantastic. And th that's like, I think, the big opportunity for people who um, learn to communicate well is to create a community right. and then to look after that community. Walt Disney didn't say, well, I make Mickey Mouse cartoons, so that's all I'm ever going to do. You yeah. know, And so I think in digital, you have zero startup cost. You have billions of audience around the world. Really, it's for you to decide how you want to engage with people. Yeah. And, and what, what are the passion points? Yeah. Let's watch the clip for uh, Pitbulls, the okay. clip for Dog Dynasty. Ooh, you ready for this one? So yeah, so we're going to go to Miami. Mm. We're going to go meet up with some of the fans, hit the beach, get the fandom going. Is that the Hulk? Yeah. Then see them all the Hulk is around. It gets crazy. 
Yeah, it's a big thing, and um, I never would have imagined it unless I've been <laughs> part of that journey, quite honestly. <laughs> but, um, mm. it, and, and really, when we look at Google search trends, it's definitely, out of all our, our brands, that brand really resonates much higher than any of the others. One of the things you told me is you said that Barcraft has 10 returning shows across mm -hmm. Avod and across YouTube, Snap, and Facebook. Yeah. And then you have three channels. Mm -hmm. One's called Beastly. Mm -hmm. Is that where the pit bulls sit? Yeah, that's where that came from. So that okay. was called Barcroft Animals, and it okay. we've uh, recently moved it to uh, renamed it Beastly because we realized that everybody loved stuff with big teeth and claws <laughs> that was scary. And <laughs> so we've stopped doing all the gentle stuff. I love it. And then what are the other two channels? Uh, Barcroft TV, which was our first channel, okay. which it, I suppose has moved towards being a kind of populist female skewing lifestyle channel yeah. and um, then Barcroft Cars which is, is what it says on the tin. Right. And then you have 11 Facebook watch shows and 9 snap shows. I mean these mm -hmm. really are they become franchises in right. that sense. And okay. a lot of them exist in the same places. So, for example, <coughs> Born Different, which is a show we do about disability, mm -hmm. that is very popular on uh, Facebook Watch. It has 10 million followers. Um, Snap, it has probably the same or more. And, and it's probably the cornerstone show on Barcroft TV as well. Mm -hmm. um, it has a community of people that care about health and well-being around it as well. So, um, that, so that's become... Uh, a big franchise and um, Shape My Beauty, which is about female empowerment, not female, sorry, about empowerment around oh, oh. Um, uh, kind of people who uh, strive to overcome uh, issues. Um, that's become a, a brand as well. So, so that's what we're trying to do is build whole kind of uh, verticals around these right. shows. So I want to talk a little bit about um, interactivity or how you interact with audiences in a different way. And you've already sort of started talking about that by saying, you know, you also sell them T-shirts. Right. You know, obviously people like your shows. They comment. They become fans. You mm -hmm. have communities. Um, we're trying to get to this most incredible homes clip with sure. Facebook Watch. So how does the how does the interaction work on that. I mean, so that was an experiment we did with Toby Faulkner, who's the head of Unscripted at mm -hmm. Facebook in LA. So um, we were discussing what Facebook wanted to do. And with their originals program, Facebook are really keen to make shows that only Facebook could make, could only work on Facebook. I think that's their remit. Yeah. And um, that's been fantastic because when you're a TV producer and you're going into those dreadful meetings where you have to beg people to give you work, mm. um, essentially it's just a 2D show and it has to fit lots of kind of intricacies and idiosyncrasies with each different broadcaster and each different commissioner. And unless you know every show they've made in the last three years, every show that's gone wrong, why it went wrong, and why you're going to solve their problem, it's pretty tough. So you have to dedicate a lot of time to helping them solve quite particular problems in 2D. So in Facebook, Toby said to us, look, if we're going to do a show together, we have to work out a show that you couldn't watch even on TV that wouldn't make sense on television because otherwise, why are people going to come to Facebook to watch TV? Because right. they've already got TV. It already exists. Right. So, um, so what we did was we took a kind of positive approach where we said, I know, guys, we love, everybody's loving these um, stories we're doing about remarkable homes. Let's do a sh an interactive show around homes. And so he was like, OK, what do you think? And I said, well, why don't we try something where we show people all these amazing homes, and then they have to vote which one's their favorite. And then at the end of each time, we'll then do a video with the winner kind of as a, as a test of a kind of a talent format, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really fun. And we did th uh, 360 walkthroughs of the properties as well that you could watch on Facebook on your phone, so you could wander around their homes um, mm -hmm. with them guiding you around. Um, and it was just really good for those guys guys to understand how the polling would work um, because Facebook Watch had a voting system um, embedded in the video. So that was good. And also, we could see how the comments were flowing off right. it and um, see if we could create fans around that. And I, it was just really fun um, as, a, as a kind of production experience. Toby is a really good TV buyer, so he understands how to make good television. Right. We understand the data and the audience really, really well. So it was a good uh, meeting of the minds in that sense. Should we, uh, let's watch the clip five. Most Incredible Homes. Would you like to live <clears throat> in a crazy cool home like this? I love waking up to this fantasy world. How about going off-grid and up high, deep in
in the jungle. This is luxury treetop living. You can have the best of both worlds. And if you like colors, and I mean all the colors, would you be living the dream here? <clears throat> There's never enough color. It's just visually awesome. Each week, we're going to blow your mind with three utterly unique properties. And at the end of the show, with the click of a button, using our built-in poll, you can vote for your most incredible home. And this worked on Facebook. Did it work? I mean, did you make I mean, money I, on it? I think they were really pleased with it. We got paid to make it, so oh, so Great. we were fine, um, right. which we don't most of the time. Yeah. On the, so so that's what. So that wasn't a rev share. You actually got paid up front. Right. And Good. the thing is, is I I have to commend these platforms because they're doing the jobs that a lot of broadcasters don't want to do, which mm. is they are driving innovation and they're mm. putting their money where their mouth is and trying things that they know are most likely going to fail most of the time. Now you know? we've talked a little bit about channels in the new streaming and social media world, mm -hmm. sort of, you're sort of saying we're moving away, you're moving away from channels towards shows. Mm -hmm. But we've got this Inside the Snake Church to talk about. Yeah. Discuss, you know, how do channels and content change, you know, and, and how, does, how do you see, as, how, what's the, what is the evolution of a channel, I guess? So, yeah, I think channels um, became very, it, the, what people don't realize in content is how important technology is. <laughs> Because um, all us people that work in content think um, that it's all about how clever you are about which talent you use or you know how you open the show or how many minutes before break one. And, and we all think that it's all about the editorial, that wonderful phrase in the script. But really, with nowadays, t content journey is mostly user experience around technology. If someone can't find your film, they're never going to watch it. Simple mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. if, um, if you don't understand how, to, how everything works, then you're never going to... Um, have success, and that really comes with trial and error, comes with a constant engagement and constant adaptation. And so, um, the channel that we we've, we've realised that publisher channels don't have a brand affinity very much compared to personality lad channels, because somebody looking at you in your face, talking to you every day as if they're your best friend, is a super emotive experience. And um, and really, just somebody sending you different films every day is is a much second. It's a second grade human interaction. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what we realized was people would love shows. So we broke into shows. But now we realize that there's a kind of an evolution coming back again where those shows are, uh, are almost turning back into channels because when they come really big, um, people want spin-offs. Mm -hmm. So look at Gold Rush. I don't know if any of you guys watch Gold Rush, an amazing show on made Discovery. by Raw that's on a, that's Discovery. I think they're the longest running franchise. And, and it's incredible because now it has more show. It's al almost a channel yeah. now, you know, <laughs> because it has so many yeah. spin-off shows and right. things that come from it right. that these things are becoming ensembles. They're becoming um, curated spaces mm -hmm. around a certain passion point. And so now we... I've been working on something called Truly, which is um, an attempt to really make sure that we are going up the uh, chain of, uh, back up the ecosystem chain towards curating content that we really love. And what comes down to for me is I love documentary, I love authentic, amazing true stories, and I want to create a community around the whole genre, not necessarily around a particular niche. And so we've been developing slowly a brand called Truly, which can become that go-to place for um, documentaries. And we made the Snake Church some years ago, and um, probably two, three years ago, and that kind of speaks to us trying to create beastly and truly both as um, channel brands that really stand for something, which is a much longer term project than just launching a show that is a very simple start, middle, and end. And so this is what we call a channel. <laughs> so it's like a it's like a show, but it's also a channel. Oh, it's channel. a channel, right? So okay, we've we coined a new I'm, phrase, guys. I, I'm in Germany. I'm very proud to be in channel. Germany and be invited here <laughs> at a time of Brexit and all the other challenges we have. So thanks for having me. And but I am killing the English language <laughs> as we speak. So um, here we go. It's not a show. It's not a channel. It's a channel. Okay, let's mm. watch the um, let's watch the next clips inside the Snake Church. These snakes, it's a part of the Bible, and I'm going to put that before anybody. I've been bit six times. I don't think it's crazy, it's just a sign from God. Snake handling, it is not for me. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. The purpose of our church is to spread the name of Jesus Christ and get people saved. But if you've not been raised up in it, and you look at it, you go, like, man, them people's crazy. 
Ooh. Oh, God. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> They've all woken up. They've all woken up. <laughs> Yeah, you said they were gonna get they, they were gonna get more intense, yeah. right? Okay, so Snake Church, I got it truly. Uh, let's go into talent because I think talent's very cool. The way you incubate talent, and that's something that you know TV's worked on mm. over the years, tried to figure out. Talk to me about how you think about talent and how you're incubating talent. Well, we try it a few different ways. We love bringing new people through the ecosystem. You know, if you're a big producer. Um, essentially, you're going to look at established talent. So you're going to look for people that you know everybody knows. Um, we'll see that Kylie Jenner has just done a much bigger deal than mine uh, this <laughs> week because she's established talent. Everybody, right. you know, um, everybody who's under 40 knows who she is and uh, wants to buy a part of Kylie. So that's why her makeup firm, she's just sold for $600 million. So yep. um, that's at the top line of talent. And, and But for us, because we work in a world of normal people with amazing lives, we want to bring new talent through and people who are super passionate. And I'm also a big believer in younger talent because I think that TV is aging up a lot. So most TV viewers are 60s and 70s and 80s now. And so really we have to provide a new wave of talent because if it's left to the state broadcasters, mm -hmm. they're going to have to just program for older people, which right. is fine. And that's good that they are looking after that section of our society. It's the most valuable part of our society. But um, we have to create uh, new faces and bring um, respectable kind of trusted information to younger audiences because at the moment, the only trustworthy information is aimed at the elderly. So... Um, uh, anyone can say anything to young people. Young people have an amazing bullshit radar, much better than older people, um, because they've had to learn it in the trenches. <laughs> um, but uh, it is important. So we're regulated in the UK by Ofcom as a service. Um, on which, television? Um, no, online. Online. Yeah, because we're seen as a catch-up service, oh, like see, all right. four. Or, um, and I'm really proud of that, because mm. um, it helps my journalists know that they have absolutely no ability to work outside of uh, correct information, which is important. So so talk about this next clip, Lizzie. Lizzie, Lizzie Daly. Lizzie's just amazing because she's a young biologist who's embraced social media. So she loves animals. She loves the natural world. She has her own social media. And you discovered her, right? No, I think she discovered herself. But okay. we, we, we're working with her to help tell stories about the natural world okay. um, because I just think she's a brilliant expert. But she won't get much of a run on... British TV at the moment because she's too young, she's female, you know, and essentially she's not one of the three or four faces that they know will bring a number um, on a peak time viewing. So it's just an example really of how we use beastly encounters as a strand to try new talent and to try and get some people mm -hmm. to catch attention of the internet and then hopefully we can build shows around them. Let's, uh, let's see that clip, clip seven, Lizzie Daly swims. <laughs> I'm Lizzie Daly. I'm a marine biologist. I'm wild about nature, and I absolutely love sharks. I really love them. That was absolutely amazing. And I'm on a mission to get up close and personal with as many sharks as I can. So good to see these animals so close. They never get boring. I love it. So I want to, we want, I want to try to save some time for Q&A. I know we're running up against the clock here. One of the topics we wanted to talk about was sort of what's the next step? What's production company 2.0 look mm -hmm. like? Which is basically what we've been talking about. Yeah. You know, what does it look like? And in that, I'd like you to also maybe get us to that last clip about extreme love because that was sort of a, an interesting journey about online to linear. Yeah, that's a yeah. fun clip. So um, essentially uh, what we do is um, we ride the algorithm in digital um, and we do that. We're able to do that through our editorial because mm -hmm. we understand what sells newspapers, what people want to listen to, what people get excited about. It's all what us elderly men in media <laughs> um, have learned over a long, long period of elderly time. Elderly at 29? Well, yeah. a little bit more than that now. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, um, essentially, we've learned what uh, people get excited by. And we now, we've, Prodco 2.0 to me is an organization that has a portfolio approach, mm -hmm. i.e. lots of different things yep. um, that are set up to ensure success by not 
spending too much money and by giving you multiple chances. Because really in digital, nobody knows what's going to work and what doesn't going to work until you try it out. And then um, the things that do work, work 10, 50, 100 times more than the ones that don't work. And so it's a bit like a hedge fund. Mm. Um, mm. It's the same approach where you have nine failures to every success, but yeah. the success pays for the failures. Right. And so <laughs> essentially um, in digital, you have to keep going in that type of approach. And so I think Prodco 2.0 is about um, building really good content uh, that really uh, captures people's hearts and attention and then making sure that you create an ecosystem where you can take lots of chances alongside that at low cost until mm. you hit another pot of gold, mm. another thing that everybody mm. gets excited about. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have an ecosystem where we make money in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. And then um, often that's little bits of money. It's not the big bit of money, but that helps subsidize all our production and all our content. Um, and then the big hits pay for all of that endeavor and adventure. And I think it's supporting a culture of adventure mm. um, through really pragmatic decision making and making sure everybody does more than one job not b working late but just working clever mm -hmm. and efficient mm -hmm. and so Extreme Love is a show that did really well for us on Barcroft TV uh, transferred into uh, Facebook did really well there as well it has a big community on Facebook there's a hundred thousand curious people who love interesting relationships um, who are in a private group on Facebook another um, hundred thousand yeah Gosh. yeah we've okay. got more I think group members than nearly any other publisher on Facebook Amazing. and so um, essentially it's really sticky content mm. it gets you it grabs you you don't know where to look but <laughs> also there's something unfortunately compelling about <laughs> it so you have to engage with it and so um, but you also sold it to yeah it's on uh, we TV in the US it's a big Friday night show there um, it's on pro Sieben as well it's in a lot of other countries as a TV show so we've taken it from being a um, a short video series on YouTube. Now it's across lots of platforms and it has spun out this big international TV show um, and, um, and it's a community and we're, gonna have com we're having conversations about you know, how we do more with that community. So uh, this is the tape of Extreme Love. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's a love story. They're all love stories. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, um, yeah. it's fun because actually younger people are really interested in yeah. uh, people who have different types of relationships. Yeah. The internet has widened everything out. It's made much mm. many more things less uh, mm. socially worrying. Um, yeah. and, but young people want to know it's okay to be different. And yeah. so a lot of what we do is about encouraging people to be honest yeah. about themselves yeah. and to feel like they're not alone. And um, a lot of what we do makes young people feel uh, a little braver about stepping outside the door every day. Which yeah. is a very positive message. Now, I know we don't have a lot of time, Peter, but can I open up to questions? Does anyone have a question? There's one here and there's one there. So if we, we will sure try to get these two. Uh, this man first, yeah, and then Mark. Hi, I'm Ned Wiley. Question for you. You say you learned a lot from your mistakes. Is there a single mistake that stands out in your mind and could you say a little bit about what you learned from it? Goodness. Not to do it again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, do you know, I think th there's been a few hiccups along the way, but most of my mistakes, Ned, have been really small ones. And I think that's, that's the thing I've learned. Make your mistakes small and often, you know, because, um, and then learn from them. And so I think we haven't had any, you know, uh, we're still going after 16 years, which I think nothing's been terminal. And that's another big learning of mine, that terrible things are rarely terminal in business. You know, it's, uh, and so actually most, the obstacle becomes the opportunity in most of these things. So if you can set up an environment where making mistakes 
often is, isn't is a terrible thing, is, is okay. Um, as long as you learn from them and try not to do them again, then I think that's what I've learned. And I've learned to try and encourage people to be brave enough to make mistakes at work so that we create a culture where if things go wrong, they don't get screamed at, you know, where people just accept it and try and move on. Um, so I think creating that uh, safe space economically for that as well as culturally is really important. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful. No, that's Sorry. Good. And then Mark, right here. Yep. <coughs> Hi, Sam. Fasc just fascinating stuff. Um, <coughs> I, I made documentaries for years. I worked with broadcasters for years. I completely relate to everything you've described about trying to sell a show inside a broadcaster and all that stuff. But around documentary, I mean, documentary in theory was supposed to be the thing that broadcasters, especially national broadcasters and, pu and public service broadcasters, would kind of protect forevermore, mm. right? And they've essentially, they've completely given up on it. And there's, there's remarkably little documentary now on, on, on those channels. Um, and yet, you know, Unless it's an Attenborough documentary. Well, right, yeah. you get a few standouts, but, but it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's really far, far less than there used to be. Um, and yet you and others like Little Dot Studios have, have built successful businesses on documentary. So it's a question A, how, how they managed to get it so wrong when you managed to get it so right? And B, do you think that that, that inability to see where to take documentary next and how to take it to new places is a sign that, in fact, those broadcasters are in, in bigger trouble? Oh, good questions. Um, I would say, A, how did they get it so wrong? I think when you're in survival mode, you often um, just trim to the things that work most powerfully for you. And right now, for the British broadcasters, I think that that is scripted and live sport um, and a little live entertainment. But they are the three things that still work and still bring six to 10 million mm -hmm. viewers on a good night. Yeah. And documentaries struggle to get over a million, maybe two these days. And so it's just a math game in terms of limited airtime. You can only have one show on at once pretty much, whereas on the internet you can have a million things all the mm -hmm. time. They, they've got a structurally uh, compromised model for anything other than live content really um, and so I think it's security and the stuff that works best but then I used to get very upset by that and now I've decided it's fantastic news <laughs> because otherwise no one would watch what we're doing because um, <laughs> they'd all be on the broadcasters watching uh, that amazing content because um, it's very hard to make really good documentaries. It costs hundreds of thousands of pounds to make an hour long documentary that's really very effective. We're working on a tenth of that money and so we're able to take advantage of the uh, clear air, clear water as it were. Mm -hmm. um, what comes next for broadcasters, I think uh, print, the mm. newspapers are pretty much all still there, despite their absolute terrifying cliff that they've fallen off. The company that I've joined, Future, has kind of absolutely become a, a shining light in the industry of publishing to show a way forward. Um, Apple have turned music from a nightmare into a huge uh, economy. So I think that television has um, been so successful over the last 30 years that it's slower in decline than a lot of those other industries have been. Um, and I think hopefully the, the streamers have come up, up the other side already, so they won't have quite the same value that other industries have had. Uh, you just have to realize that everybody's, instead of playing football with us on this pitch, everyone's on that pitch, so we just have to move pitches maybe. Um, but I think there's um, a lot of great content in documentary being made, but most of it is now turning up into indie docs or into streamers and not as much on television, sadly. Um, mm. But I think that the, the broadcasters, um, uh, as long as we see it as an industry and not as a set of organizations, we're okay. But I think those organizations are, have got um, to a lot of hard work to figure out the best way forward. Yeah, mm. some, sometimes in our business, you know, people speak as if there's some kind of, some kind of social obligation to protect broadcasters. And kind of what you're saying is that well, no, as, as long as the content ecosystem is rich and you know, find, people find. are making great stuff and people are enjoying it, it 
it, yeah. who actually is making it and then the model which is made, it's just, it's just kind of Darwinian. And who's really. distributing it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like we're resetting, you know, how people are going to watch, where they're going to watch, and what they're going to watch. And, and it may not be on the broadcasters, certain content may not be on the broadcasters. Yeah. Uh, well, who knows? I think no. the, the audience will decide in the end. Exactly. We have to stop here because we're already over time, but this has been a great session. Could you please join me in thanking Sam Barcroft? Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You.